So I picked up this fantastic Distin, um, beautiful old saw, did some restoration work on it, um, re uh, cleaned up the handle, and I'm looking forward to using this. Uh, it is a, a 4 TPI rip saw. Um, and if you don't know the difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw, um, I made a video on that and you can uh, look at that up in the, uh, the side. Um, and I need to sharpen this now. So I've done everything else on it. The, the plate is up nice, um, um, shined up the brass and cleaned up the handle, but we need to sharpen it. Now the first thing we want to think about is uh, what is a rip saw as opposed to a crosscut saw. And a rip saw is basically intended to go with the grain of the wood. So if I'm cutting across, excuse me, if I'm cutting a across the grain, I'll be cutting that way. And if I'm ripping, I'm going to be going with the grain this way. If I'm going across the grain, all those fibers that are sticking up in there, I need to cut those with a knife. Whereas if I'm going with the grain and going along the fibers, I actually want to have more of a chisel that moves out the fiber. So basically what I want to end up doing is turning every single one of these teeth into a chisel so that as it goes through, it makes a little slice out. And basically the way we do that is we use a file. And this is a, a triangular saw sharpening file. Um, it's not actually triangular, it's actually um, six-sided, and even the thin side has a bit of a flat on it. And that gives you a, a little bit of a flat bottom in the, the bit of the gullet. Um, if it ended up being dead sharp, that would actually be a point at which you could get a tear and the, the saw blade could rip. So you want to have a little bit of a flatness in the bottom of each tooth. And uh, the other thing about this is that because we want to turn them into chisels, the file is going to stay at 90 degrees to the plate. So the whole time we're going to keep the file at 90 degrees. We're not going to turn it this way or that way, and we're not going to move it this way. We want to keep it at 90 degrees. That makes sharpening a rip saw actually very, uh, very, very easy and, and, uh, and simple. So I'm going to take you through a few steps on that. Now the very first thing I want to do is make sure that all of these teeth are sticking up the exact same amount. I don't want some of them sticking up higher than other ones, other ones being down low, um, because then you have a different, uh, different teeth that are connecting and it pushes through and it kind of gets jumpy as it goes through the wood. And so what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to take just your standard file and I'm going to set on top of the teeth, keeping it flat uh, and uh, perpendicular to the plate, and I'm going to run it all the way down the, uh, the teeth, right across the tips. And what I'm looking for is making sure when I run it down that I'm hitting every single tooth. And I'll notice after that first course, I'm hitting every other tooth. And you'll see this shiny spot on the very top of each one. So now that I see that I'm hitting every other tooth, I need to go over it again and make sure that I'm getting every single tooth. So I actually had to go over this several times in order to get a shiny spot on every tooth. There's a space about here and another space down here where it was hit every other tooth. Um, and that can be done through problems of filing, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, now that I have a shiny spot on every tooth, we can actually start sharpening each individual tooth. So basically what I want to do is keep the file at 90 degrees to the plate. So I'm running straight across it. But I also want to roll the file forward. What this then does is it basically changes the angle of attack on the chisel so that the chisel is leaning more forward. If I were to keep it up and down, basically the chisel would be staying up and down as it went through the wood. So it wouldn't be very good to cut the wood as it went past this way. I want to cut the wood like this. And so I want the, the chisel aiming forward towards the front of the saw. So I'm going to roll the file slightly forward. Um, I don't want the back of the file to be perfectly up and down. I want it to be relaxed just a little bit. Um, some people like it to be perfectly up and down, and some people actually like it to be fully aggressive and actually leaning forward. Uh, I don't like that it makes it far too aggressive, makes it hard to push through the cut. So once I find the angle I want, I'm going to make one stroke through and I'm going to check my progress. Now, now what I'm looking for is that flat spot on the very top of every tooth ends up being the very point. And I want to turn that flat spot into a point, but I don't want to take anything more. So the very point of the tooth needs to be somewhere in that flat spot. So I'm going to stroke 
until that flat spot disappears or gets very close to it because I'm also going to be doing the tooth behind it. So as I do the tooth behind that, I'm also going to be working on that same flat spot. Now, one of the things that I used to do is do every single tooth from one side. Um, and that's, that's not a huge problem other than the fact that that pushes a burr onto the far side of every single tooth. And that means that this side of the blade is going to be cutting a little bit more and it could lead to the, the, the cut starting to curve. Um, so what I do is I do every other cut, every other tooth, and then I'll flip the saw around and do every tooth in between so that I'm going from the opposite direction. So this tooth will go that way, and this tooth will go that way, and then this tooth will go that way. Um, so basically I'll do every other tooth this way, I'll flip the saw over, and then it'll allow me to do every other tooth the opposite direction. So now that I've done the first tooth, I'm gonna go on to the third tooth. And I'm just going until that flat spot almost disappears. That way when I flip it around and I do the other side, I can make the flat spot disappear completely. And just slowly but surely, I'm gonna go all the way along this thing. Now one thing that some people like to do is actually use a sharpie and mark all the way across all the teeth so that you know which teeth you've done. Um, I have found that um, brand new um, clean teeth, uh, it takes the oxidation off it and you can very easily see the difference between the teeth that have been oxidized and the teeth that have recently been cut with the file. So I don't mess with that, but you may find that uh, marking all the teeth to see what you've sharpened and what you haven't helps you out. So let me finish up this side, and then I'll come back to you when I do the other side. So now that I've gone along every other tooth from one end and worked my way all the way down to the other end, I'm going to come back from this end and go to the other end doing every other tooth. Um, but this time I have to remember that my teeth are pointing the opposite direction, um, so I have to roll the file the other way. And so I'm just going to start back down at this tooth and I work my way back down to that tooth and we'll uh, pick up where I left off there. So it's a little more of the same thing. The only major thing is on this one, I want to make sure, I want to make sure that when I'm done, every one of those shiny spots is completely gone. And I've made sure to leave a little bit of a shiny spot on every single tooth, trying to leave about the same amount so that when I make a file pass, one or two file passes will get rid of the shiny spot behind and in front of the file. So then I will know that every tooth is the exact same height and once that shiny spot disappears, every tooth is deadly sharp. So start from here, go down to there. So now I've gone through and sharpened every single tooth. Every tooth is at the same height all the way along. All of the gullets are at the same angle all the way down. The only thing left is setting, um, and this was not uh, has not been set in a while. And what the setting basically is, is how far the tooth hangs out past the side of the plate. Because basically all the teeth then point out past each other, every other one going the opposite side of the plate. What that basically does is it creates a cut or a kerf that is wider than the thickness of the plate itself. And when that happens, uh, that allows you a little bit of movement in it. Also, the, the wood doesn't bind on the plate. Um, some people like a lot of set, some people like just a little bit of set. Um, on a big teeth like this, I like a, a decent amount of uh, set. Um, I want the, the actual kerf to be a good bit wider than the plate. That gives me a couple things. Number one, I'm going to be cutting through bigger stock, maybe even wet stock. Um, and I don't want that to be binding on the plate as it warps. Also, it allows me to have a little bit of movement so that I can guide the saw through the cut and possibly even turn it um, as it goes down the cut. So let me show you how I uh, do the setting. So to put a set on the tooth, um, I use a, a saw set. And what that basically is, is this hammer that pushes against an anvil inside when I squeeze it. And so I'm going to put a sawtooth in there and it will bend the sawtooth towards the anvil and just give a little bit of crank and it will flex back a little bit, but it will still be bent more than just being straight up. So let me set this in here. 
And so basically, as it goes down, it will crimp that tooth one way, and then I'm going to skip a tooth, go to the next one, and I will crimp that the same direction. Then I'll go all the way down the blade, skipping every other tooth, and then I will come back and do the other teeth in the opposite direction. And when I'm not bending over like this, it's actually very fast. Um, but it's a little more difficult bending over like this. So I'm going to crimp these out and come back to you. Basically, I only do that about once every five or six uh, saw cuttings. It's not something that has to happen very often um, because it takes a lot of filing to get down past that set. And so it's basically something I might do once a year. Um, with how often I'll sharpen this one, it'll probably be about once every two years that I'll actually have to put set back into this saw. So let me finish these up and show you what we have. So now that it's all sharpened up, cleaned up, and ready to go, let's give this booger a test drive and uh, see what she does. This is white oak, uh, about three and a half inches. And that's happiness. It's fun to just get going on one of those. This is a, uh, this will be a workhorse. Looking forward to spending a lot of time with this saw. So, um, all told, the uh, sharpening on this probably took me around 30, 35 minutes. So I hope you like this video. Uh, sharpening a saw is a, a great skill to learn because uh, once you do it, you can pick these saws up at garage sales for a dollar to five dollars a piece, and they'll last you a lifetime. Um, and you really don't have to sharpen them that often. Even when I'm working with white oak quite a bit, I'm usually only sharpening them like once every three, four months, and that's using them most every day. And so they, they go pretty well. You'll uh, kind of get the feeling over time of what a sharp saw is and what uh, a dull saw is. So if you like this video, please hit like and think about subscribing. I want to say a huge thank you to my patrons on Patreon. You guys are absolutely awesome and are an amazing encouragement to me. So thank you and uh, keep it up. If you uh, want to check out one of my other videos, you might find something you like there. Doing a uh, sharpening on a crosscut saw as opposed to rip saw. And what exactly is the difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw? I hope you like it. And until next time, have a wonderful day.